Hi, I'm Judy. I'm here in Sugar House with Jed Matthews, owner and master roaster at the Bean Hole. Well, now master roaster, I gotta, I gotta interrupt. Master roaster is a certification. I am the roast master. The roast master. Yeah, I'm in charge. Okay. okay. <laughs> I just gotta throw that there because uh, it's just one of those. Things. I have it a little backwards. A little bit. That's okay. Okay. I'll get, I'm getting there. Perfect. Hopefully one day. That's my aspiration to be a roast master. What do you have to do to be a roast master? Now I'm off distracted, but Already. it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a SEAA certification. And so it's, I am not that advanced in my certification. I have uh, just a basic roasting certification through uh, Diedrich Manufacturing, who is the manufacturer of my roaster. Okay. So yeah, it's just hours and uh, different classes. Great, but you're on your way. I'm on my way. Okay. So you produce micro roasted gourmet co coffee here. I tried to, yeah. Yeah, right off the of 21st stop. <laughs> so, Jen, how did you get started in the coffee business? Well, I am kind of a DIY guy at heart. And so, uh, originally, I was investigating coffee. My coffee experience went pretty quickly from like grinding my own coffee to being really curious. And that led me down a rabbit hole. Uh, essentially, at that point, I realized and have read that you could roast coffee at home. So that was something that I immediately had to try and do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was sort of a thing that happened where all of a sudden I was buying a lot of coffee online and giving it away like, a, like every good home brewer would do is like, you gotta try my stuff, you gotta try this out. And that got really expensive. So I was like, we gotta so do something different. So you had to stop giving it away. <laughs> exactly, okay. you had to turn it into a business. It was the only way we were gonna be able to really explore the the direction of, of origins and different things that I wanted to look into. That sounds super cool. It was it was not something I anticipated. But it <laughs> but sounds it hit me fun quick. and yeah. So tell me about your first experience roasting the coffee. That was done on what is called a popcorn pumper. A popcorn pumper. Right. If okay. you're a child of the eighties you maybe your parents let you uh, make your own hot air popcorn where you pour it in you pour it in and it, it spins around and you keep watching out. and pretty soon it starts popping out the top okay. that very same device was a very simple rudimental way of roasting coffee and i did that for several years and i burned up a lot of them and i scoured all of the thrift shops for everyone i could find the yellow and white happened to be a very specifically uh it was a quality piece of equipment that had the 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 way that the air lifted the beans was was something that not the style that had a wire on the bottom wouldn't work as well okay. and so it's that true. consequently is considered uh, fluid bed roasting which is not what i do now i do drum roasting now okay what is drum roasting drum roasting <laughs> is okay so yeah we're, we're, that's the two major splits of roasting uh styles uh drum roaster the beans tumble around inside with the exterior heat okay. uh, source and that creates a roasted coffee uh, fluid bed is essentially elevating the beans on a bed of hot air. Okay. And so it's a two major splits of the entire roasting community. So you started out with a fluid bed. I did, yeah. And then you went to the drum roaster. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And, the, and my drum roaster was, you know, it's it's designed to be a coffee roaster, not a popcorn popper. <laughs> so a big change there. But yeah, it's it's definitely just uh, preference, really, for the roaster. Okay. Um, where did you buy your first green coffee beans from? Where did you get them? Uh, locally, I bought them from the uh, Salt Lake Coffee Roasting. Okay, so they uh, sold you green beans? Uh, they did for a, a shorter period of time, and then they were annoyed by me, and they sent me on my way. And that was when I found more online. Uh, there was a company called, I think they're still around, called the Coffee Bean Corral. And they had a, a, a this like this magical selection of stuff that I'd never heard of, you know, from all kinds of weird places all over the world that I'd never even heard of. Harar, Ethiopian Harar, and things like that. So. Um, that was when I started spending a lot of money on coffee, <laughs> on green coffee. And giving it away. And giving it away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some, people, some people sometimes they would give me money for it, but mostly I was just really proud of what I had created because it was amazing and I couldn't believe that I had done that in a hot air popper in my garage. Mm -hmm. Which is a key factor if you want to do that, by the way. Do it in your garage, not in the house. Does it, does it it's make smoky, it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's smoky, yeah. So... Where are, are you currently sourcing your beans from? Uh, we are partnered with a company called Atlas Supply out of Seattle. Uh, they're super handy for a guy of my size, a roaster of our size. Uh, we're able to order a pallet full of coffee that is one bag of this and one bag of that. 
um, and they, they cater to very small roasters. So that it's really convenient. They have a great database. They have a great team. They also have a, a warehouse in New Jersey, I believe, and then another one in San Antonio, I believe. So they're a big company, but they focus on, they have big roasters as well, but they focus on people like myself who need uh, would like variety, number one, and not just one copy. You know, going direct to source is something that I would obviously love to do. Every roaster would love to do that and know who's growing their copy. But that's not really a very viable option uh, if you're a small roaster. It's just not something that's going to be very easy to do uh, logistically wise, bringing it in, importing it in. It's really hard to do. And I have met several. I, I've traveled to a lot of locations that were really cool and I met a lot of cool farmers along the way. But I just haven't been able to, you know, manage that kind of buying power mm -hmm. to buy a container of 150,000 pounds. You better pick well. Yeah. yeah, you might be bummed out if you yeah, get you, something that, you're that, stuck with that it. yeah, you're stuck <laughs> with it, and you're going to have to, you know, convince everybody it's the greatest coffee in the world. Yeah. Well, I bet you can do that. I, I would try. <laughs> <laughs> and we may get there. You know, we're we're definitely growing. I've, it's it's been a slow growth. You just heard my keg radio shut off there. I guess that's a little noisy, but. Um, we're we're definitely growing. It's been it's been slow growth, but it's been very steady, and and we're excited about the future. Nice. Um, I'm curious what a micro batch means. So by definition, that would be a um, hundred and fifty pounds per batch or less. I happen to have a three kilo roaster, so I'm more of a micro micro roaster, and uh, that definition is is almost silly when you come into my shop. You know, that's certainly not, we're definitely a micro roaster, but we're one of the tiniest. Yeah, we're, we're really small. Mm -hmm. But in that, and I know that, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things about making a small batch is that I have really easy options for controlling that. I can experiment really well with that as well without, you know, taking too big of a risk. So a massive amount of coffee would be would be something if you're not really at the comfortable or know exactly where that roast level is. It's easy for me to do profile roasting, which is another conversation, but um, it's a it's a process of, of trying to decide where that coffee should be finishing up in the roast, whether it's a light roast or a medium roast or a dark roast or anywhere along the spectrum. Um, it's a lot easier to do that with a small batch. And my customers are super keen on letting me, you know, just use them as guinea pigs. They're always pretty happy. They're willing to taste what you make. <laughs> they're willing to take, yeah, they're, they're willing to give it a shot most of the time. So, I'm surprised. yeah, if, if we can't, if generally I can find a roast for somebody if they're if they're not happy with something that they've tried, which generally doesn't happen. They're they're like, nah, it wasn't as hope, I wasn't as good as I was hoping. Then I can coach them into something else, or we can play with the roast. It's a small batch. That's the beauty of that. How many bags would you get out of a batch? Um, I yield about uh, seven bags per batch. So what I typically put into my roaster is about 6.85 pounds of coffee. That gives me a little bit of wiggle room in the in the roaster so I can control the heat if I need more or less. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so basically I get out of anywhere from a light roast would be, you know, in the 5.8. So almost 20% in a dark roast is lost out of the stack, which is moisture going out into the smokestack. Or a lighter roast can be in about 14%. So yeah, it varies quite a bit. But so the darker the roast, the less product at the end. Correct. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So a, a good example of that would be like my espresso comes in 100 pound bags, and typically I'm pushing around 18 to 19, sometimes 20 percent, uh, depending on the weather. Uh, and so yeah, basically I'm only able to sell 80 pounds out of a 100 pound bag, which is not great if you're <laughs> if you're a yeah. small roaster. That yeah. that definitely cuts into into the whole process and. And even on a big roaster, you, you, you experience the same thing. But a lighter roast, you kind of get away with that. With the, you, you get to sell more coffee. Mm -hmm. And you get more caffeine. Oh, really? That's good to know. That's a common <laughs> misconception that uh, espresso has more caffeine in it, but that's not generally the case. It's A uh, lighter roast will definitely have more caffeine. As the roasting process goes on, you'll burn off caffeine. Interesting. I know. Sorry, I'm nerding yeah, out. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's, it, it's really interesting to know. So um, with your small batches, mm -hmm. What, how does it affect like your aroma and the uh, acidity of the coffee besides the flavor that you can Yeah, okay, so um, partly I would say kind of like what I was talking about before is the experimentation. I can play around with things. Uh, I get great tasting notes. So when I order the coffees, I usually buy them looking at what their uh, characteristics are. Um, I can... I can dial that in a little bit easier with a smaller roaster. It's it's pretty easy to kind of 
decide where you want to be along that spectrum. And so it doesn't necessarily, I wouldn't say um, it changes that aspect through the size of the, the roaster, but there's less risk involved for sure. Yeah. And so it's easier to kind of pinpoint the things I want to try and uh, accentuate. For example, uh, I have a, a Java copy right now that um, it's actually from the island of Java. Um, it's touted as having like apple wood and hops and a little bit of citrus zest to it. And that's definitely not going to show up in a dark roast. So uh, when I first got that, I played around with the roast level quite a bit, trying to find how light it needed to go to, in order to accentuate that. So the notes are the, like the apple wood? And Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, and there's obviously, you know, some other aspects of like uh, acidity, which is a generally considered a good thing in the roasting community. It's not like acid where it's, oh my God. No, it's uh, more of a, uh, the weight on your tongue and the body of the coffee. So you, you get a bunch of different aspects of mouthfeel and acidity and, and things of that nature, as well as aroma. It's making coffee sound like wine to me. It is really amazing. is similar, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've done a, a several yeah. uh, uh, tasting courses, uh, coffee cupping it's called. Uh, and, and in doing that, you're absolutely trying to dissect everything that you're tasting. And, and it's a challenging prospect. There's some people are really good at it and some people have to try really hard. I have to try really hard. But do you think that having the small batch helps you get the results that you want? I think I would say so. I mean, it's. I think if you if you had uh, if you had a larger roaster, I think you'd be kind of dedicated to just getting the job done. You know, you'd be you'd be focusing more on on uh, on creating something that you were just you're selling instead of being able to play around a little bit more. Yeah. So you're you're almost creating coffee art. I try. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I I know that cold brew is really popular now. It is. Uh, how long has cold brew been around? It's silly how long it's been around. It okay. really has, especially on the East Coast. It's been, uh, you know, 20, 25 years. There's companies who have been producing it for a long time. I just, I just like, I've known about it for maybe five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we started bottling about seven years ago when I was at the farmer's market. That was one thing that I used uh, cold brew to get people to talk to me in the summertime. In the afternoon, we were at the Sugar House Farmer's Market, and it was difficult to get people. They definitely didn't want hot coffee. Mm -hmm. But when I started rattling little cups of uh, iced coffee, they were inclined to come over and make friends. Yes. And it worked <laughs> really well. And eventually, people would encourage me to uh, to try and bottle it up. And we went through the, the aspect of getting the label certified and everything of that nature in order to uh, legally sell it. And it was it was another fun project for sure. As far as the whole art, trying to create copy art, that was a big, big change in the lineup for sure. Mm -hmm. Speaking of copy art, I have a, a glass of the cold brew here yeah. with the nitro in it, and I'm really, really a big fan. I'm going to taste it right now. I actually ended up building a, a nitro box that I took to the market. So our evolution from the market was to get it in 16 ounce bottles of concentrate. And then I built a box that I just wheeled into the market and flipped the lid over. And it's, it's, it's a pretty crafty looking box, but uh, I can show it to you later. Um, but yeah, it had two taps on it and I would start serving nitro at the market and that just went off the hook. And so that was really a big push for me to get the uh, keg grader in the shop and, uh, and start playing with more of that as well, mm -hmm. which is intensely popular. It's starting to pick up now that spring's coming as well. Good, it's good stuff. So speaking of the nitro. Yeah. I really need to know what it is because I have no idea what. Sure, when <laughs> we start. Nitro and I'm like, <laughs> I mean, like in cars. Yeah, it's not that it's not that magical, but it, it looks really cool. And uh, I think we took a video earlier, maybe. But uh, when when I do my cold brew, I generally do um, a batch about 24 hours of cold brew steeping, and we collect that. At that point, we have our concentrate. Uh, we either bottle that up, or sometimes I'll just chop the batch in half put some of it into the bottles and then we'll take the other half and put it into uh, homebrew kegs, a five gallon uh, corny keg, and we'll infuse that with nitrogen gas. And when that's done properly, it creates a beautiful cascade effect, but it also creates this really heavy, uh, creamy tasting mouthfeel to it that it tastes like it has cream and sugar it does, in it. It does. Yeah. It's and so because good. our shop doesn't offer cream uh, due to our you know restrictions with the agricultural department, uh, we we lean on that pretty heavily. If somebody comes in that's not typically a black coffee drinker, we try to be friendly. <laughs> we did, we're friendly with everyone, but um, when uh, when we started doing that, it was a really game changer because it is so easy to drink black and there's nothing in there. There's no sugar, there's no cream, but it tastes like it has it in there. And it's just a gas. It's just nitrogen gas, yeah. It's pretty good. 
Um, I noticed on your website that you have also made recipes for food and beverages. That's true. Yeah. And they're not really my recipes, to be honest. I, I, we have people who have played with our stuff and turned it into recipes. Some of them are really good friends. Some are people who are just customers that, you know, really enjoyed uh, injecting coffee into pork loins and doing some really crazy stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> using them. Uh, uh, in fact, one of them the, uh, on the recipe is uh, Tyler's, uh, rib rub and that's a fantastic one uh but if uh, you feel like ribs especially but uh yeah they uh the most of the stuff there's people are using the cold brew especially the concentrate in a lot of different fashions uh, my wife will tend to use it in her like protein shake before she goes to the gym oh, wow. you know especially if she's going early in the morning she needs a little kick in the pants pre-workout you know, pre-workout yeah exactly so it's her protein shake with a you know, shot of coffee in there and that works really well for her um, and then there's the whole evening aspect that people use it with uh, alcohol quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And so they're making a, you know, a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, there's, uh, I know there's one on there that's my wife's favorite and it's kind of a, a chocolate vodka and, and cold brew. It's good stuff. Uh, we do, we play around with a lot of different kind of aspects. There's a rum chata that's really good too. Um, but that's kind of that whole, I'm not gonna say Red Bull effect, I guess, but you're getting caffeine and you're getting the alcohol at the same time. So it's a fun thing to play with for sure. Yeah. yeah. Sounds really good. It is. And we also have, the, there's another one on there that was like uh, popsicles, cold brew popsicles that our friend made that was, they were pretty awesome too. I would like to try that. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's just it. I mean, it's kind of a, you know, one of those uh, aspects of summertime and hot coffee doesn't really appeal to everyone. So right. yeah, yeah, if you start making some, you know, nice iced coffee cocktails or, a nice a thing popsicle. to have in the evening. Yeah, very popular. Adult popsicles. <laughs> so, Jed, when people want to buy your roasted coffee or mm -hmm. your cold brew, how do they go about purchasing from you? Well, basically, um, I've, I've blamed my kids for a lot of stuff in my life. And this business, I, I take care of my kids quite a bit. Um, I get them off to school in the morning, and I'm there when they get out of school. So they're still young, just 10 and 6. So my shop's only open on Saturday to the public. I'm here an awful lot more than that producing and, and I also have a, a few wholesale accounts. Uh, one of those being uh, Hello Bulk, which is a zero packaging store. Uh, they're located on the north end of Salt Lake on like 4th North out in that area, just a little bit west of uh, West High School. And you can actually purchase our coffee beans bulk there. And that's the only place where you can buy our beans, whole beans out there. Um, and they're a great company. We love those guys. And we met them through the farmer's market as well. And uh, besides my shop on Saturday, you can also now, this is fairly new within the last uh, couple of months, uh, Honest Abe's is a drive up coffee shop that is affiliated with Harbor Restaurant and they're good friends of mine. Uh, when they opened up, they were adamant about us roasting coffee for them. So they have my espresso there and then they also have kind of a proprietary blend that I make for them, which is a, a three bean blend, kind of a Central American and African blend. It's, uh, it's got a really nice sweetness to it, but it also has some complexity. So. That's the, uh, yeah, that's pretty much your options to do it. Or come in on Saturday from 8 till 2 a, or till 2 p.m. Um, is generally my hours here. And so pretty much here every Saturday. 8 to 2. 8 to 2, yeah. Okay. And then can, does Honest Aid do your cold brew? Not yet. Not yet? They, they, they're talking about it. They're, they're still kind of getting their wheels turning and getting everything kind of dialed in. So the um, cold brew, you need to come here The cold Saturday, brew, you got to get here. To that's that's okay. pretty exclusive <laughs> for the shop. Exactly. Okay. Sounds good. It's, it's totally I'm going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Well, I will, we'll be happy to see you. Yeah. Well, Jed, thank you so much of course. for taking yeah. the time to share your story with me. I really appreciate it. It's been a learning experience for me, and I thought I was a big coffee fan before. Now I'm a <laughs> really a big coffee fan. Well, good. I'm, I like, you know, I, I try to, uh, I try not to even pretend that I know everything about coffee. I think it's an evolution. It's one of those things where, uh, it, it's really, it's like a moving target constantly. It's, it is almost like wine. Like the yeah. every year to year crops change. I've had copies that I've had for years that have changed a little bit and we just try to adjust to what is going to bring out the, you know, the best, the best copy that we can make from what we get. We're fortunate. We're so spoiled. Yeah. We have great yeah. coffees. Yeah. yeah. There's a, it sounds like you have a lot to choose from and a nice supplier to choose from. I do. They're really good to me for sure. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to try more stuff and see what's happening right. next and how the flavors <laughs> change. So if you want to come in and see Jed on Saturday from 8 to 2, 
You can find him here at 2153 East, 2100 South. Great. We're right behind Jed's Barbershop. Yep. It's a little not, bit tricky to find. Not Jed. Not me. I only have but... one cut. It's pretty much a buzz <laughs> cut all the way around once a week. Gets me ready for the show, you know. You also have your website. I do. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it needs an update, but it's, it's there. It's, it's alive. There. It has good information on it, <laughs> it and it's good pictures. W, and the recipes are on the website. Yeah. That's where I found mm -hmm. www.thebeanhole.com. Correct. Do you want your phone number? Uh, sure. I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah, everybody has it. 801 674 4445. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That was fun. <laughs> that was really fun.